The Saudis, as we both know, have an extraordinary amount of money to invest, but there are, at this event, a great many investors. So money and money managers. Not everybody can get everything. How competitive is it, and what's your key to getting the Saudis to work with you? Well, listen, I think the Saudis have a very long-term perspective in how they're trying to invest their capital. Uh, I think the Saudis are also very focused on having a two-way street with investment professionals and investors, i.e., uh, can they bring investors to the region and can they make quality investments around the world? I think, generally, you have to separate yourself by doing something particularly well and being able to evidence that you've done it over the past 20 years. Uh, we do believe uh, the world of credit certainly the world of private equity, uh, and now the world of real estate. We, we've been operating in these asset classes over the past 20 years. I, I do think the illiquid, self-originated asset classes, certainly of direct lending, of real estate lending, of energy infrastructure, of private equity, uh, we might be able to separate ourselves somewhat, both from track record and from uh, the length of time we've been in these asset classes. Does that message resonate here and in the Gulf region in general? I think there's no doubt uh, that we're seeing two pretty important factors uh, to us uh, in the alternative asset industry. And, and the two factors really are, one, uh, we are seeing a rotation of capital from depositories to non-deposit, to large institutional investors like sovereigns. Uh, we're also seeing, which to us is sort of how we built Aries Management, we're pursuing, we're going after the asset classes. Large banks are leaving whether they want to or whether they're being forced to, but going after those asset classes in a very substantial way. Would you say, and this may sound like a funny question to some because we see the stock market up more than 15% this year, and we know the ETF story. Investors in public markets have been doing great, but the reality is the real money investors, to your point, are putting more and more into private markets. Is this the age of illiquidity? Well, I don't know if I'd quite describe it as the age of illiquidity, but I think people have realized that there are huge opportunities in illiquid markets. Uh, listen, when interest rates are very, very low for extended periods of time, asset values, lo and behold, are rather high. So people look for self-originated, illiquid assets that, generally speaking, can, uh, shall we say, survive uh, adjustments in the marketplace. And uh, for whatever it's worth, when you're in the middle market lending business, when you're in the private ABS business, when you're in the energy infrastructure business, when you're in the rescue lending business to the energy industry, these are all rather interesting places to be. Yes, illiquid. On the other hand, uh, meaningful performers in all types of markets. They generate a higher rate of return. No doubt. And uh, as you saw in today's opening, uh, we had several large uh, world-class investors talking about uh, expected returns for their investors. In the single digits. Uh, I would say uh, three to four percent is very much in the single digits, at least that I heard at the opening ceremony uh, and discussion. Uh, and let's face it, uh, the alternative asset manager and our business model is here to generate 8 to 10 percent returns in credit and 15 to 20 percent returns in private equity. Uh, and yes, yes, we are far less liquid in many of our products, but we think we uh, pay our investor for that illiquidity. So, Tony, you and Aries have been successful in finding those private markets and those, if you will, illiquid opportunities enough to grow your firm to triple it really over the past 10 years to $108 billion in assets now. But as more and more money chases those opportunities, in part fueled by investments from Saudi Arabia and other countries, are those opportunities disappearing? Well, uh, it depends on the market, of course. But uh, as far as we're concerned, as, as we talked about this, shall we say, transition from bank balance sheets to non-bank balance sheets, uh, the origination of middle market lending uh, once existed on the balance sheet of large banks now is moving off. So uh, this asset class is much, much larger than many folks in the marketplace might appreciate. Uh, so our view is, uh, yes, at some point uh, competition changes and certainly people uh, should expect lower rates of return in certain areas. But generally speaking, in private credit, uh, we're big believers and continue to be. You may be aware, Tony, that uh, a decade ago, uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, the outgoing finance minister of Germany, 
suggested that the rising amount of debt could trigger the next crisis, and of course, he was spot on. Are we at that point yet with the accumulation of debt, particularly in markets that aren't as visible as they used to be to financial regulators? Um, that accumulation of debt is, is getting to a point where we could be confronting another crisis? I look at 2017, 2018 uh, very, very differently than how we perceive 2007, uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, the financial institutions were so much more levered and so much less transparent in the 2007, 2008 period. Um, I would argue financial institutions, at least in the U.S., have had enormous improvement in their balance sheets, and we should take some comfort in that. Uh, yes, people are using leverage, and yes, there are individual investors and institutions that continue to buy long-term assets with short-term liabilities. Yes, you should scratch your head over that. But, but that's, a, that's an institutional issue. I don't think that's a market risk as much as I believe it's an investor or institutional risk. What about uh, underwriting standards? The longer a credit cycle goes on, the looser they tend to become. This credit cycle is getting pretty long in the tooth. How loose are those lending standards? Well, listen, there's no doubt that when interest rates are this low, asset values, uh, shall we say, are somewhat inflated. And yes, I, I do believe if you're an investor in credit, as an example, you should know who uh, your, in, your, your investment professionals are. I, I think credit matters. The analysis and evaluation of credit matters. Uh, we're living in a world with very low interest rates and very low default rates. So uh, generally speaking, uh, this will come home to roost at some point, no doubt. We see it, well, we saw it a year ago in the energy industry as an example. And uh, all I'm trying to point out is that you have to evaluate credit quality if you're in the credit business. Um, and some people have forgotten that, I believe. You see it from both sides, right? As a private equity investor, sure. pick toggles and Cove light loans are wonderful. But as a underwriter, well, please understand, as I talk about credit, uh, I know appreciate uh, being in the private equity business, being in the self-originated direct lending business, and being in the syndicated loan and high-yield bond business, uh, it's an enormous advantage to really be in all of those asset classes, if you will, because you do compare and contrast, and you do try to go where uh, the opportunity is most attractive. How long do you think alternative asset managers like Aries and I could name a few others in your ballpark. Carlisle, Blackstone, of course, KKR, TPG. Haven't heard of those guys. I Never. Oak Tree, let's <laughs> throw them in as well. For how much longer can they continue growing at the pace they've been growing? Not all of those firms have tripled assets in the past 10 years, but they're all at $100 billion or more. Sure. Well, listen, uh, in terms of, uh, for most folks in the asset management business, hopefully they would agree, it's not about uh, the rapid growth in these assets. We, we actually uh, could have grown meaningfully faster than we have. Uh, our view really? is, are, are you growing with assets uh, that are, in fact, assets you manage well, assets that you have lockups, assets that you can live through bumps in the road. So as far as I'm concerned, and I'll bet uh, most of our uh, friendly competitors would agree, it's not really about your growth. It's are you growing into assets that you're outperforming uh, for your investors? And, and at the end of the day, we see a whole lot of assets, as I keep saying, and I am repeating myself, but a whole lot of <laughs> assets that are moving off the balance sheet of institutions that used to own them and frankly are no longer the right type of institution. Middle market loans should not be on banking institutions that have 15 times leverage and frankly are residing, if you will, on the balance sheet of sovereigns or investment firms like ours. So these are clearly good times. You're finding opportunities. Your investors are increasingly turning to your firm to solve their problems. Um, you could have grown even faster than you have. What isn't going right? What concerns you? What keeps you up? Well, uh, listen, if you're in the asset management business, you should be concerned about uh, asset prices and low interest rates. And at the end of the day, uh, we aren't uh, and generally aren't approached by investors to stay in cash. <laughs> what we are approached is to buy in the best way we believe one can protect themselves from a very high price market is to buy very high quality assets. 
And whether that's in the senior lending business or in the private ABS or private uh, asset-backed lending business or in the real estate lending business or, as I said, in forms of private equity, uh, you have to decide, uh, do you want to stay in cash? But if you're going to be an investor in today's world, uh, be very, very cautious in the quality of the assets. Does that mean you're more cautious today than ever before? Yeah, listen, uh, what investor in the world says they're not cautious? Uh, at, at the end of the day, what we're saying is the focus on high quality assets is to us the best protection in a very high priced marketplace.